Welcome, everyone. Um, my name is Lynn Sorrentino from IUCN, and I'm here today with my colleagues and from UNEP and from IUCN globally to discuss with you solutions for ocean health and introduction to the tutorial for the UNEP IUCN National Guidance for Plastic Pollution Hotspotting and Shaping Action. Our agenda today is quite packed and full of really interesting information. We will initially hear from the UNEP team from Ron, Ran, Ran, sorry, Ran Zi and Feng Wang on the progress of the use of the UNEP guidance. Um, then I will go into spending a little bit of time introducing the tutorial itself and its videos, which are meant to be used to guide you through the use of the guidance to perform a plastic pollution hotspotting assessment. From there, we'll have discussions from my IUCN colleagues from Eastern and Southern Africa, from Asia, and from the Mediterranean, discussing interventions and results from the hotspotting reports. And then we will wrap up with some questions and answers and a short closing from Janica De Silva of IUCN as well. So with this, I would like to, okay, I'm sharing the wrong screen. Okay, I wanna share this screen. <laughs> okay, hang on. Um, we'll just share this one because I'm struggling with this um, as it is. Should I share the first one or it's okay. We'll share this one. We'll start off with you, Ran, and sorry about the uh, mispronunciation. I'm a little nervous as you can tell. No problem. <laughs> thank you very much, Lean. Uh, and uh, yeah, uh, thank you everyone for joining today's uh, webinar. Uh, I will uh, give you some quick uh, overview of the guidance uh, from UNAP side. Uh, so first slide, just uh, to could you could we move yeah. to the next slide? Oh, sorry. There you go. Thank you. Uh, just to remind uh, the participants uh, of the purpose of the guidance, because I think most of the participants for today's webinar may already have a background uh, knowledge uh, of, of uh, the UNAP IOCN guidance. Uh, this guidance uh, aims to provide a methodology uh, to support countries, regions, or cities to identify uh, key hotspots uh, in terms of plastic polymers, uh, applications, pathways leaking to the environment. And upon the identification of those hotspots, uh, the guidance can also help you to identify the associated interventions and instruments to address those hotspots. So uh, it's uh, can uh, basically help you to answer three types of questions. Uh, where along the plastic value chain that you need to take actions and what actions to take and uh, how to take them. Uh, next slide, please. Thanks. Uh, the guidance uh, follows a structure that can be uh, seen as a series of layers. Uh, and in the core of this structure uh, is the polymer and sector uh, hotspots. Uh, they, are, they can be regarded as a baseline for uh, the hotspot uh, analysis uh, or uh, assessment by using this uh, methodology. And each layer will add some certain uh, degree of uh, complexity. Uh, meaning that you will need some extra technical skills and uh, mount up data in order to uh, obtain uh, the, your baseline in terms of other types of uh, hotspots, uh, which are uh, application hotspots, the meaning uh, what types of the plastic packaging or, uh, products are contributing most uh, uh, to the leakage, and also regional hotspots uh, based on GIS modeling and uh, uh, waste management uh, hotspots, uh, which will help you understand which part of the waste management system uh, in your country need to be strengthened to mitigate uh, plastic leakage. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, in order to get uh, your baseline in terms of the five uh, categories of the hotspots, uh, we also call them dimensions uh, in the context of the guidance. Uh, users need to collect uh, relevant data related with the five dimensions and uh, run uh, through a modeling process 
which will help you reconcile uh, different data from different uh, and often conflicting uh, sources. Uh, and in the context of the guidance, we use a uh, mass balance to reconcile all the information and yield a coherent and uh, standardized baseline assessment result. Next slide, please. Uh, the guidance provides a combination of steps and tools organized in different modules. Uh, and this cover different aspects of data collection, data modeling, and action identification. And all the tools and modules are uh, interlinked and the guidance can be applied by following a step-by-step -step approach, uh, which will be further presented by my colleague Lin uh, from IOCN uh, when she uh, introduced uh, the tutorial menu. Next slide, please, thanks. Uh, this slide uh, is just to show an example from uh, the pilot report from Thailand, which you can also find from the, the guidance website. Uh, it gives you an overview on what uh, will be the final results from uh, applying the guidance. Uh, after running, after uh, collecting all the data and running the modeling process, you will uh, get a better understanding of the collection rate, recycling rate, and plastic waste management rate uh, in your country, and also the total plastic leakage and leakage per uh, capita data. Uh, you will have a, a concrete uh, list uh, of hotspots in terms of polymers, uh, applications, and uh, where uh, in your countries, uh, which provinces or uh, geographical locations are contributing most to the leakage. And based on all this, uh, you will have a, a final list of the prioritized hotspots and also uh, the interventions uh, which could help you to address them. Next slide, please. Uh, last year, we released uh, the English version of this UNAP IOCN guidance. And early this year, we also have the Spanish and Portuguese version of the guidance ready on the website, uh, which uh, aims to help more uh, non-English speaking countries uh, to fa uh, facilitate the rollout of the methodology uh, in, in more regions and countries. Next slide, please. Uh, I will just, uh, uh, mentioned very quickly uh, on this, but Lin uh, will later give a more comprehensive overview on uh, which in which countries uh, we are now applying this uh, guidance or uh, where the application work has already been done. Uh, from UNAP side, we are now developing a Jeff project entitled Reduce Marine Plastics and Plastic Pollution in Latin American and Caribbean Cities through a circular economy approach. And under this project, uh, we applied this methodology uh, in six cities in the Latin American and Caribbean region, uh, which allow us to uh, set up the baseline in terms of the plastic uh, waste generation, collection, recycling, leakaging in those uh, six cities and do a, a quick comparison uh, and also uh, Get a better understanding of the waste generation per polymer. Next slide, please. And uh, we find uh, this methodology uh, in this whole application process uh, very helpful in uh, helping us uh, structuring our data preparation phase. And uh, it guides you through the modeling process and also the uh, provide very useful guidance on uh, the consultation with local stakeholders uh, regards what are the data or information needed to fit into uh, the modules and tools. And uh, uh, in the context of the guidance, we have a standardized uh, definition of uh, key concepts related with waste management, which are very helpful uh, to help reconcile the data. And uh, next slide, please. 
uh, just for as a closure of my part, I would like to re-encourage uh, users to go to our website and download uh, the guidance and the tools modules. Uh, now I will give the floor back to Lynn so that she could uh, introduce more about the tutorial menu, which will be, uh, I trust, uh, useful for you to uh, run through the whole methodology. Thank you. Thank you so much, Ran. And I'm going to try and share the proper screen here so that we actually have um, a little bit better view for everyone. And I apologize for this. Is that better? Tony, is that better? So you're seeing the whole screen or my notes? Okay, great. Um, so thank you. Thank you so much, Ran, for introducing the guidance again. Um, what I would like to speak to everyone about for the next few minutes will be um, sharing a little bit about the map of where the methodology has been used in part or in full and introduce everyone here to the tutorial that's been produced this year. So in the map, you can see there are several countries in red, although there are several also that you can't see because they're very small like Jamaica and Panama on the list, but the red countries are the places where IUCN and UNEP have deployed the methodology in full for a full hotspotting assessment um, of plastic pollution. In the tan or brown color, you can see that there are countries such as Russia and America and the most of Europe that have been managed for plastic pollution or sorry, plastic packaging waste by plastiques who are um, www.plastiques.org um, and the green map items were areas where the World Bank with some of their consultants have performed plastic pollution hotspots hot assessments in depth in um, eight countries in South Asia, Bhutan, India, Nepal, Pakistan, Afghanistan, Sri Lanka, and Bangladesh. So as you can see, the guidance has, in the year and a half that it's been around, produced quite a lot of interesting data and has been used by um, organizations outside of IUCN and UNEP. The tutorial now, which is designed to teach you um, how to use the guidance um, in depth, is available here at plastichotspotting.lifecycleinitiative.org slash tutorial. If you can go to this website um, and follow along with what I'll be speaking about, that would be possibly helpful for you, but you're not, it's not needed. We are going to cover the introduction at a very high level, but I would encourage everyone to go through the tutorial and look at what is presented there. So the tutorial itself has three specific basic phases phase A, B, and C, made up of 28 steps. And phase the last phase, which is 20, step 29, these 29 steps will allow you to understand the basics of how to collect data, where to collect data, how to collect waste management data, how to calculate the share of plastics based on the management data that you collected, and how to generate the hotspots that you're looking at for your country or your subnational or local level. In the tutorial itself, the, okay, the bottom points, it's, um, it's a little small. Okay, sorry about that. It looks like, yeah, it looks like the screen's a little bit cut off, but, um, the yellow parts on the slide are the important parts. Those are the instructions for using the tutorial. And starting with phase A, the tutorial is actually starting on slide 16 and 17 on the website. Um, we have videos that go with each tutorial step as well, or each tutorial phase as well. And these three phases in step 29 will allow you to produce a fairly comprehensive core hotspotting assessment for your national or subnational. Um, needs. And the tutorial, as mentioned, is composed of these 29 steps. Um, can you see all 29 now on the screen? Tony, is that look okay? 
Okay, so it's, if you're looking at the PDF of the tutorial, you can see this is sort of like a game. It's um, the first step in blue, which is phase A, the step in sort of a tan yellow is phase B, and then the last 10 steps are in a pink purple color. It starts with very basic collecting data at a desktop level, all the way through using the tools, the modules, and the videos to produce an actual assessment. So in phase A, which is tutorial slides 16 and 17, and the video tutorial is chapters one and two. That is the desktop data collection using Comtrade or Bachi or your national databases to find information on the collection and production um, and trade of plastic so that you can do the modeling. The collection of the data on recycling, the calculation of recycling, and the export of plastic by sector is also included in phase A. And again, as Rianne said, this is a step-by-step, -step, very linear process. And as you can see, the first phase takes 10 steps and leads you then into, once you've finished the data collection and processing, you go into phase B, where you look at different data, which is the waste management data, where we validate the littering rates, release rates, the calculation of plastic shares, um, et cetera, all by management, based on the management by each sector. And again, this is about 10 steps as well. This is tutorial slide number 18, and the video tutorial for this is chapter three. Phase C then, is the calculation of shares of plastics that are based on the management, um, whether it's mismanaged waste, uncollected waste, leaked plastic, et cetera, by polymer. Um, this is tutorial slide number 19 and video tutorial chapter number four. When you get to the end, then you end up with the finishing point for selecting your hot spots by polymer and by by sector. This is tutorial slide number 20, and it's the video of the tutorials chapter five. So when you're finished and you're performing your hotspot selection, you'll be able to choose from the top polymers that are producing leaking or that are leaking in your country, the top sectors such as pa packaging, textiles, automotive, medical, etc. And you'll be able to form then a selection of the hotspots to identify to take it that next step, which is addressing the um, potentially addressing policy and things like that with your data that you've collected and analyzed. Now that's a core hotspot assessment. The complexity of the assessment is now um, the next steps. If you wish to go into more detail on waste management or on the GIS modeling of your regional hotspots in your country or application hotspots. And again, this slide may not show up entirely. I hope it's showing up a little better, maybe. The important part here, though, is to see the yellow part. It's the instructions here are the tutorial slides 28, 29, and 30, and 31 will allow you to walk through um, additional complexity for applications, such as um, recycling and manufacturing by application and calculating the shares of plastics in those applications. The waste management detail is also next. Um, again, waste management practices in terms of collection, et cetera, all the way through to the GIS modeling of maps. And once you're finished with this, this is actually quite a complex process, but you will be able to see there are additional steps for applications and additional information related to waste management that produces such things as these charts that you can see here. These are all again in the tutorial and they're linked in the tutorial labeled as to which module you'll be using and which tools you'll be using. So you end up with a waste management um, grid. The green items on the grid are items that contribute positively to waste management. Gray items are either neutral or not assessed, and pink items are negative impact to waste management. The exciting part, I think, of the guidance and the tutorial is learning about how to do 
the regional or geographic GIS hotspots. The important thing here is that you end up with a map that shows you which areas are most critical inside the country or at a subnational level inside the cities or regions regarding plastic leakage. And it can be by um, including geographic, hydrographic, and demographic information so that you can model that and show, again, what you end up with here on the right is plastic leakage by ton that is a leakage map that shows actually where the problems are. And that's certainly quite useful when you're again looking at how to present this to policymakers, because you can overlay these maps with maps of the country in terms of where certain things are that might be vulnerable or particularly valuable. And if there's a lot of plastic pollution there, that creates more evidence for cleaning it up. When you apply the tutorial, at the end of working out the um, worksheets and the um, modules and tools within the guidance, you will end up with um, charts. Each tool, tool three specifically, will generate for you um, charts and results that you can read through and see, for example, which type of polymers are leaking, um, the waste produced in the country by kiloton, domestic recycling needs, export, disposal, whether it's proper or improper, et cetera. So you end up with um, charts that really allow you to understand where things are a problem. And out of the tools, you'll end up with charts like this. The, this is an example of a mass balance bar chart specific to polymers. And as you can see for each polymer, LDPE, HDPE, polyester, et cetera, on the left, the bar is the inputs that have been done. And on the right are the outputs that you get from the tools. And again, this information allows you to help, help your policymakers and decision makers make science-based decisions on waste management. Um, you also end up with, out of the guidance, actionable hotspots. And these actionable hotspots will address for you where you should have specific concerns, which are the round dots that are specific to plastic um, within that country or within that region, or generic hotspots, which concern basically all plastic, all regions. So each assessment that you do ends up with this information in it so that you can identify the problems again, whether it's burning of waste or lack of waste segregation or plastic from packaging being leaked because of higher consumption, et cetera. So again, more evidence, more data that you can use then to present to people to help make decisions. And the exciting part here at the end is interventions. Within each assessment, you are walked in the tutorial through a means to identify priority interventions related to either sustainable production, sustainable consumption, waste collection, waste management, waste infrastructure, recycling, etc. And the priority interventions are deemed such based on, again, the amount of data that you put in and the results you're getting out, what's, what's being shown by the models that have been created as part of the guidance. To see some interventions that have been proposed in the IUCN 8 pilot assessments, these are available online in the reports that are on the piloting page of plastichotspotting.lifecycleinitiative.org slash pilots. And with that, um, I would like to hand over now to my colleague, Peter Manyara. Um, keeping in mind a little bit of what Ran said previously about the results that she showed from Thailand, what Peter is going to be speaking about is highlights from Kenya, Mozambique, South Africa, and the United Republic of Tanzania from our national reports, the results and interventions that were produced, again, by using the tutorial and by using the step-by-step -step method of the guidance to get to this uh, point of delivering some actual results. So Peter, I'll hand it off to you now. Yeah, thank you very much. <clears throat> so from all we've heard about the methodology, at least we had a good opportunity to apply this at the national level. And with that, we one of the things which is very interesting is even for countries where 
you tend to see maybe more or less similar socioeconomic setup and almost similar state of development. You get very significant variation in terms of, for example, the material flows within these countries, what is exported, what is imported, whether as virgin or products, there's really significant variation. Then you also get variation in terms of the plastic waste recovery rates across the various countries with dispar disparities in urban and rural areas. You get differences in the mismanaged plastic index. And also you see these variations on the slide on what leaks to the environment or to the marine environment ultimately annually at the end of each year. But also what is important is given the state of development of some of the urban areas in these areas, the per capita waste generation and leakage is not similar. If you compare, for example, Mozambique, Maputo, and you compare Dar es Salaam in, in Tanzania, those two are cities, but you find one leaks more than, than the others. But also you get to see some similarities in as much as on the slide, I don't know whether you can see for all the countries, what you see circled in red is different polymers, which are priority when it comes to leakage. But one which is relevant across these four countries where we apply the methodology and also could be relevant for other African countries is PET, given its wide application in packaging, in, in fibers, in beverage bottles, in agricultural mulch, and in just general containers that are used for food, food packaging. And then the other dimension, I think, that is brought out clearly by this particular type of assessment is uh, on the regional or more maybe geographically, you're able to see that in each of these countries, there are priority cities or district or provinces that are most relevant in terms of addressing plastic pollution. In Tanzania, for example, you see that Dar es Salaam accounts for about 70% of plastic leakage to the marine environment, meaning that if you are to focus your interventions in, in Tanzania, then you're likely to achieve significant reductions of pollution from Tanzania overall as a country. Next slide, please. So I think, yeah, I'll highlight briefly the benefits that we derive from these results. So we use the results to engage in a lot of the national action planning processes. In the case of Kenya, for example, we use these results to inform the Kenya National Marine Litter Management Action Plan. We've, these results have also been used to set the baseline and targets for the Kenya Plastics Pact. We've also engaged closely with the South African Plastics Pact in terms of uh, the specific baseline numbers for South Africa, what is included, what is not included. And we've also engaged with national stakeholders in South Africa in terms of determining what dimensions of uh, plastic source materials could, for example, be considered in doing an, a global, a, a national iteration of the global break the plastic wave study. But again, lastly, we are also using these to conduct provincial consultations in Mozambique and the national consultation to develop the National Marine Litter Action Plan. Next slide. So I think one of the issues that was well pronounced in all the four, four studies where we did the assessment is the issue of open littering and dumping. I think this is an issue that is really prevalent across the 54 African countries. And so one of the things we did is we, we just focused on this particular issue to do an issue-based assessment together with the University of Western Cape and the Council for Industrial Research, CSIR in, in South Africa. And so one of the interesting insights we find from this particular assessment is that we don't really need to wish dump sites away, but I, I think working closely with local nonprofits who understand the social structures and cultures of low-income communities, especially in townships and slum areas, could go a long way in terms of rethinking some of these dump sites that are used in multi-year phases by communities in terms of getting municipalities to actually collect waste that is dumped into these particular dump sites. So it's an interesting study with application across Africa in as much as we did it for South Africa. So I'll stop at that and invite my colleague Mev from the Asia Regional Office to also provide some insights from Asia. Thank you, Peter. And hello to everybody. Um, so 
in a similar manner to Peter, I just want to, to highlight some of the, the findings from the national hotspot for Thailand and for Vietnam in the Asia region. Um, just starting with Thailand, um, you know, the overview what we found in Thailand was actually that there was a fairly high collection rate um, of 70%, 58% uh, of which was mismanaged uh, waste, meaning once it had been collected, it was um, proving to, to be leaking into the environment in various forms. We also found a fairly low 9% recycling rate, which struck us as quite odd in that there is a significant domestic demand for plastic scrap in Thailand, which is currently being met by imported waste. So we decided that you know, that's a significant finding in terms of what we needed to look at as to why that is happening. In terms of the key polymers, which are um, causing the highest leakage um, in Thailand, we see LDPE and HDPE, partly because these have very low or, or insignificant value on the market in terms of their recycling uh, prices. Um, whereas PET, there's an established value chain in market and, and a significant higher collection rate as a result. In terms of application or products, when you go to a dump site in Thailand, you're seeing possibly 70% of the volume is plastic bags, these cellophane plastic bags, and snack and bag pouches. So the sort of takeaway street food vendors that would sell in various different forms of takeaway packaging. So these are the two products that we're seeing as the major issue. In terms of sector, we're seeing food packaging, food and beverage packaging, and textile industries as being the highest uh, contributors and possibly uh, predictably um, in terms of the regional hotspots, we're seeing the most focus in terms of the issue around the urban centers and a disproportionate or a mismatch between um, waste management facilities and volume per capita of, of waste produced, which is also an interesting fact. When it came to the analysis of waste management, we see significant, the pink highlights, this is the, the, um, the chart on the right, the pink areas highlight where we're seeing negative contributions in terms of leakage. And we see issues with line one to three and five and six. And these are related to the generation of waste. So this is volumes, the segregation or lack of segregation, issues with collection, um, and issues in terms of human behavior and understanding of waste management, plastic waste management, um, and then basic infrastructure. So these are the key issues in terms of the waste management systems that we're seeing in Thailand. Next slide, please. So when it comes to interventions in Thailand, we focus a lot on um, these main highlights. Um, one of the one of the limiting factors in terms of actually improving recycling rates is a policy in Thailand which prevents the use of secondary plastic in the food and beverage packaging. And because that is, we've seen, is one of the most key products uh, contributing to um, the waste management issue in Thailand, we want to see where the policy blockages are in that and how we can provide the scientific evidence to try to review that policy and increase the opportunity for for the use of secondary plastic in um, food and beverage um, packaging, food and beverage product packaging. Um, we've also seen the uptake of the PLP or the value chain analysis within various different industries, including in Thai Union, looking at their own plastic leakage um, into, um, as, as a priority to understand their own plastic footprint and how they can contribute to reducing that. We ran circular economy pilot projects, um, both in Vietnam and in Thailand. And this really focused on improving waste collection systems, recycling center opportunities, inclusive stakeholder participation in those, um, in those um, uh, waste management improvements um, and improvement in recycling rates. And in itself, that had local impacts, significant local impacts. But as, as a demonstration of how to innovate and use, invest in circular economy pilot projects, it is also beginning to show dividends in terms of 
just um, our own methodology and our um, opportunity to implement grant funded investments into innovation for circular economy. And that, that will hopefully continue to, to provide opportunity for us to upscale some of this innovation investment for circular economy in Asia. We've also looked at, uh, or we, we partner with various different companies to look at the river waste interception technologies. So, so um, collection um, um, mechanisms for floating waste in, in the key river systems around Bangkok, just to look work with the government to understand on what we can do there in terms of removing um, it, the existing uh, uh, plastic waste in river systems. Um, we're also looking at, and we're working with, with new companies, including Second Life, to create value chains where they don't exist, for example, on small islands for PET bottles, LDPE, and HDPE from fishing gear, abandoned fishing gear. And Second Life has been a great partner in that they are looking at the real issue, which is the value of, of secondary plastic at the at the, at the local level. So they're able to offer a premium price to collectors on islands at the first junction to make sure that the price for transportation of these materials from the islands has been internalized into, into um, the, the economics to make it economically viable. And that's also improving the waste collection systems and the recycling rates that we know are is issues, particularly for the LDPE and HDPE, as you saw in the summary. And, and finally, we're also looking at different um, issues, uh, different methodologies to assess and understand the, um, the at sea marine debris issue. So up to 20% of marine debris in, in Asia is attributed to the fishing industry. And we're looking specifically at that as a subsection of, of, of needing to improve waste collection systems and waste infrastructure in ports, um, and also how to work with the tourism industry to to, to locate and retrieve um, these discarded nets. Next, please. So for Vietnam, slightly different story. We see for Vietnam, um, yeah. So some of the similar issues in terms of the, the key polymers that are in, in, um, leaking into the environment, PET in this case and LDPE. And again, quite shocking because PET is, has a, a large demand in Vietnam for, and actually um, some of the industries relying on scrap plastic are contributing to up to 30% of the GDP. So again, this became an avenue for looking at interventions in terms of where are the bottlenecks. Vietnam is currently importing scrap plastic to, to provide the demand for these industries. Um, in terms of applications, we're seeing similar to Thailand that that the plastic bags, but also lids and caps are some of the key components that we're finding in discarded waste that's leaking into the environment. For the sectors, we're also seeing food and beverage packaging and textile as some of the key contributors, but also the automotive industry, tires and fishing significantly in Vietnam is a significant issue, probably greater than, than it was estimated during the time of the hotspot now that we have further data. Um, regionally, actually, we have, um, you know, similar kinds of a pattern in terms of the geographic locations of the hotspots in the major urban centers. And similarly, in terms of the waste management systems, we're seeing issues with waste generation, the segregation, rates of segregation, collection, and the behavior and infrastructure um, concerns that need addressing. Next, please. So in, in Vietnam, partially due to the, to the outcome of the national hotspot assessment, we looked at the policy intervention um, in terms of also what is being driven by private sector in Vietnam. So it was opportunity driven by private sector and government interest, but also supported by the results of the hotspot. And there's a great movement now, which IUCN is is a big part of in terms of developing extended producer responsibility or EPR national policy, which is ongoing there at the moment. Again, the circular economy project looked at the improvement of waste collection systems on islands, what I broadly call the, the plastic waste free islands model, similar to Thailand, 
And whereas that has had a great localized impact, again, the demonstration of how you can invest in innovation for circular economy is also proving to be um, a, a, a fantastic outcome of and, and opportunity when it comes to planning interventions at, at the country local level. We've also contributed to the action plan for marine debris in Vietnam, which was published uh, just over a year ago now, and working on research specifically in looking at plastics in the fishery sector, which has led to a significant opportunity in terms of the integration of plastic waste management into the sustainable fisheries development plan for Vietnam, um, which looks at um, investment for port reception facilities and recycling facilities and services in um, about five key ports, um, grade one and grade two ports in Vietnam. So um, as a result of this additional research and, and pointing to some specific infrastructure investment opportunities under the World Bank program, we're already able to address the, some of those aspects relating to the marine debris from fishery sector. And finally, we're, it's, it's a relatively new piece of work, but it's working with the, the Vietnam, Vietnam Women's Union, um, and which are recognized at the national level um, to, in terms of leading the, the, the activities in terms of household segregation. So improving that, those weak um, household level segregation rates that we're seeing, which, which is the first step in terms of ensuring that um, clean domestic recyclable products are available um, and can be contributed to, to um, for upscaling and recycling through circular in the circular economy thinking. Well, thank you. That's the highlights and the summaries. Just wanted to add one last thing. I think what's quite interesting as well in terms of Asia it has been um, uh, under our policy work, we had already started to look at um, or support the, the Bangkok Declaration a couple of years ago, which looks at um, a, a sort of joined up uh, action plan for, for the ASEAN region. It has 14 actions. And now we're seeing investment opportunities um, to deliver against those actions. And, and as a result of the hotspot highlighting some of these summaries, but also some of these specific interventions that have been implemented, we're, we're also seeing traction in terms of being able to, to um, take advantage of those investments and upscales, particularly some of the circular economy innovation work. But there's um, grants for incubation um, to upscale some of that. So let me leave it there. Thank you. And uh, now it's me, right? <laughs> I'll let you know. Should I? Yeah, okay, so um, um, I'm Mercedes Diaz. I'm going to talk of um, actually what we have been doing uh, with the hotspot analysis and, and actually um, what are the science-based uh, actions that we have been doing thanks to the hotspot um, analysis. So there will be highlights from Cyprus and Menorca. And um, actually I didn't um, add any um, slide about the results in Menorca. I just mainly wanted to show you that thanks to the hotspot methodology, we are able to do some actions and very targeted with the science uh, that, that the, the hotspot methodology is giving us. So for example, in Menorca, we, uh, thanks to the results that were provided by the methodology, we, um, we kind of thought of um, what would be some of the actions or what would be some of the solutions that we can provide to Menorca in order to reduce the plastic that is leaching into the, into the Mediterranean. So after reviewing the, especially the sector hotspots, uh, well, as uh, mentioned in the other uh, countries mainly, uh, the three more important sectors were the packaging and the tourism, but there it was the fishing sector as well. And most of them were contributing to, um, to increasing the plastic pollution in the Mediterranean. So not only we reviewed the policy assessment, I mean, we did a policy assessment to understand the, the different uh, policies that were happening in Menorca, but we also review 
indeed um, an economic assessment of what is written there at the passive reform system that we really thought that it was going to be um, um, something that the Menorca island would be useful for them. And uh, it was based on the results of the hotspot analysis. They found out that, um, that it would be very useful to do this deposit reform um, to reduce the, especially the, the pollution of uh, plastic bottles because uh, Menorca is a very, very tourism area. And um, some people believe that uh, the water is not that, uh, it, it is better to drink it in a, in a bottle. So uh, this uh, proposal or this um, report, what it does is to see the viability of this, this deposit we found, which will allow to reduce the plastic pollution in that sense. Uh, next slide, please. Um, so in Marorca, after doing these two things, we actually use the results and the interventions that were provided by the, the methodology to start developing action plans. It's true that Menorca has really strong action plans, but we wanted to target in three different sectors. So uh, there was uh, tourism, waste management, and fisheries. And we did some stakeholder meetings to uh, review the interventions that were provided for the methodology to, to make sure they were aligned with the needs that they had in the island. And from there, from those uh, stakeholder meetings, we were able to provide some of the most important interventions and develop this action plan that right now is at the end of, um, of the revision by not only the stakeholders, but uh, some government uh, or um, how do you say it, um, uh, institutions as well. Uh, with this, again, uh, we were able to support some good practices in both three sectors that were coming as well from the results of the hotspot methodology and to finalize in Menorca. Uh, the other thing that um, I, I think that it's very interesting is that thanks to these uh, results of the hotspot methodology, we were able to understand that the fishing nets were one of the things that um, they should target to reduce the leakage of plastic. So what they did is they, uh, in our, our group, the, the, the organization that is working with us in Menorca, they um, gather some artisans to, and with uh, the fishing nets, they were able to provide some viable products that, well, you see some pictures there, but mainly they're going to, um, to produce the bags and the lamps. And actually, uh, they're going to start selling them very soon. So you can see that thanks to the hotspot methodology, thanks to the results that you are there, uh, you are able to provide some solutions um, that can reduce the leakage of some of the most uh, plastic that you can find in the, in the sea. Um, when you go to Cyprus, that will be the next slide. Um, actually, we did kind of, of the same process. We study the, the different um, uh, policy that was there in order to understand how we can better contribute in their needs. And then uh, it is ongoing. So that's why I put just a little picture of the slide. Again, thanks to the results of the methodology, we, we saw that the fishing sector was one of the highest that was, um, that was contributing to uh, more plastic into the Mediterranean. So uh, we are finalizing this economic assessment in which it, it's, it's trying to understand how cost fishing nets are contributing to plastic and what could be the policy interventions and what could be the solutions in order to reduce this, um, this pollution. Um, in Cyprus as well, we did the same as in Menorca. Next slide, please. In which uh, what we did actually is to develop an action plan so uh, again, reviewing the results from the, the hotspot methodology, I mean, hotspot results and the interventions. Again, we gather the different interventions. We went and asked the, the different stakeholders uh, to, to see if uh, the, the interventions that we were promoting were the ones that make most sense for them. At present, we are uh, in the final phase of this and they're reviewing the action plans that we did. Um, these action plans not only include the interventions, but also uh, are, is providing targets and is providing a lifespan. So that's why we're still under uh, revision by the different stakeholders. And of course, we, we provide the best practices that we think it were going to be important uh, in order to reduce the, the plastic pollution. 
to N uh, the, in Cyprus, they also thought about um, what could be something or what could be a product that we can um, produce in order to reduce some of the polymers that were mainly found. In this case, um, the polymers more found were PET and PP. So what they did is that they thought about um, doing something with this um, polymers in order to reduce the leakage into the Mediterranean. And they came up with this furniture. And um, actually, they um, we have some um, some enterprises that they may be interested. It's true that we started uh, right now. We just have the concept, but the idea is to keep looking into the the well the enterprises that could be interested in doing this in the future with the plastic that you can find in the in the Mediterranean. So um, this is you know it's true that I I, I mean thanks to the the hotspot methodology we did all these science based actions that I think they're um, they're reducing the leakage the those polymers into the Mediterranean. So um, thank you very much for the opportunity. Thank you so much, Mercedes and Maeve and Peter. I'm going to stop sharing my screen now and we have about 20 minutes or so for questions and answers. Um, if you'd like to put a question in the chat, you're welcome to, or if you would like to um, just raise your hand, you can. Um, I, do you see any questions in the chat yet, Tony? Okay, thank you, Peter, for answering the one that's in there. Okay. Oh, thanks. Um, yeah, we'll put the links in the um, chat and we will also be sharing the recording of this as well as the slides themselves. Um, could I maybe ask Ran to put in the link for the um, tutorial in the chat itself? Would that be okay? Um, thank you. Um, it's plastic hot spotting <laughs> dot life cycle initiative dot. Yeah, it's a little hard to, to track unless you have a link. So um, great. And I would like to, um, I think, loop back a little bit to what we were speaking about in the beginning is the whole point of this tutorial is to teach you, um, and it is a self teaching um, methodology. The videos that are there are quite, um, quite intuitive too, and they're quite well guided by Paola from um, EA. And she does all the videos and she's quite good at it. Um, explaining in detail the steps that you need to take and what you should look at and the tutorial itself provides also a lot of guidance but the checks and balances that what you should be seeing and what you should look out for in terms of things that may not look right in terms of your data so the link thank you for putting it in the chat um, the link itself will allow you to download the pdf and on that page also are all of the videos and we hope that these will be useful um, for everyone, because what, what, what we're aiming for with this work too is to get others to use the methodology and to um, have an understanding of where plastic is leaking um, and how to come about interventions and instruments and plans to um, manage the, the plastic waste in your country. Um, and I see a question in the chat. Let me open the chat here. Um, just have an idea what kind of manpower one needs to do a plastic hotspotting on a city local level. Um, could I maybe have maybe Francisco or Ran talk about that? Because we actually within IUCN, we've done them at the national levels. So I'm not sure if we have the right information to discuss it at a city or um, sub-national level. Um, Ling, if I may. Oh, hi, Fung. I didn't even know you were here. Great. Yeah, I joined a little late, so sorry for that. No, no, and no, no. Uh, yeah, let me turn on my video. So yeah, hi, colleagues. So I, I can share some lights on that. Um, originally, we started the project uh, with IC and at, at the country level, but um, since last year, we have also started 
testing the methodology at the city level, mainly in the context of a GF project in Latin America. So we were able to use the methodology uh, at the city level for six cities to um, map and also understand the uh, the hotspots and also uh, identify solution. So uh, just give a rough idea. I think the process, um, because also it involves uh, adaptation of methodology and also learning. Uh, essentially, the let's say the need is that the usually the the per capita data at the national level need to be readjust at the city level because the, the level of affluence and also consumption. So this is where we have to initially adjust that according to the data in different cities. And then um, what we did is kind of, uh, first of all, take a modeling approach to see um, from this modeling the input as import uh, production consumption point of view, what data can be. And then we complement with uh, city level data and surveys related to waste management and uh, uh, to also to different sector data to you know calibrate the modeling data so um, I think the learning in general for six cities would took around six months but I think if everything uh, goes well um, the time can be shortened to three months uh, because we that's the first time we tested uh, on the other hand um, it also involves a uh, you know, first step as a modeling and then, you know, adaptation and also collaboration from real data to, to change some of the uh, modeled result into real data. So this kind of interaction um, takes time and also need different type of expert on the ground. And uh, I would say the budget will be ranging from 10,000 to uh, 25,000 US dollar per city, depending on, you know, what type of level of data you want to get and also the granularity of the data. Uh, so that's a kind of overall experience. And uh, um, I think, you know, um, yeah, so that's the, a quick answer to that. Great. Thank you so much, Fan. Um, I see that Stefan, you have your hand up. And then afterwards, I see there's a question in the chat from Sabine, which I'll let you ask Sabine. Um, but Stefan, if you could go first, and then we'll call on Sabine. Sure. Hi. Hi, everyone. And um, yeah, congratulations for this really wonderful piece of work and uh, rolling out um, globally and then really nice results coming in. And uh, we had been part already since the beginning as, as uh, we had the chance to comment and then follow it. And uh, in that regard, congratulations. Really, really nice work. Um, I wonder, and, and thank you, you already I can kind of uh, elaborate it a bit on that um, in terms of the um, as I had to deal with uh, knowing that it's a modeling approach and it's it's not the, let's say 100% accurate data it's, it's still modeling and it's, it's a scientific approach but also th there are certain limitations and I just wonder how you have uh, handled that that aspect and especially when, when it comes to policy advice and action planning and and lock in into, into certain targets I, I I could imagine that's that is quite a challenging part um, and I wonder if you had uh, kind of triangulation with, with other methods, other results, if that, that had, has been, you know, a valid approach to, to verify basically the results would be, would be interesting to understand it a bit better. Yeah, I will go quickly on that. Actually, um, the modeling didn't uh, take much effort because uh, thanks for the team um, that's already working on the modeling at the national level for more than two or three years. It was relatively easy to, to generate, uh, you know, modeling from the, the let's say the, the model and uh, um, and the, the, the actual, let's say time or effort was really indeed a lot of data gathering at the city or ground level because we even find out that there are many different definitions even, you know, on type of data on waste collection, you know, what's really mean by collection and where are the destination for the waste after collection. And uh, sometimes being collected doesn't mean it's being treated properly uh, after the municipality collection. So a lot of our data gathering and collaboration focus a lot on end of life, including uh, littering data, burning data, open burning and uh, also different waste streams. So I think um, uh, the, the, the second layer of collaboration is also on the generation, the waste generation, uh, because as I mentioned, you know, the uh, 
the consumption at city level is more intensified uh, than the rural or the other region. This means that the modeling need to be uh, use a different coefficient. Uh, in the end, I think we reach a kind of good uh, compromise, I would say, uh, between the modeling data and the real life data and validated with the municipality and the stakeholders. And uh, I, I would say, um, again, uh, I would, I would like to stress that the whole uh, mindset of the whole methodology uh, that UNEP and IUCN developed, it's not a new, really uh, like a separate one. It's a kind of framework to be including different modules so that, you know, we have holistic picture, but for individual, um, you know, modules or, you know, uh, you know, research question, we can use more dedicated uh, uh, approaches. I, I make this example because we have been in discussion um, along the line with uh, UN Habitat, they do have a very solid and uh, comprehensive questionnaire regarding the, um, the waste management system and also the behavior at the city level. I'm quite sure that uh, there was a good way to integrate that the detailed um, questionnaires and also to see how the result of that city level questionnaire fit into the modeling uh, approach of this module. And uh, um, Interestingly, the, the, the cost uh, you know, per city that they had for the survey is very close to what the data gathering process we had, both the timeline and the cost. So I do believe that um, there are different ways to, to link and also to include that very detailed modeling, sorry, no, surveys uh, at a city level into the framework of this uh, you know, overall methodology. So that's, um, that's a nice, uh, let's say, discussion we had with the UN Habitat. and. Uh, we were also even thinking whether we can start testing uh, in some cities to see what are the results to use our methodology and no use in the habitat uh, you know, survey and how can actually we combine them. So that's kind of couple of discussion we had in the background to, to make sure that we can evolve and also to, uh, to be more inclusive towards each other. So that's a kind of um, discussion uh, we had uh, over time, yeah. Oh, thank you for that. Would, would be happy to connect on, on that regard. I mean, just, I, I mean, first glimpse, or also why I'm asking a bit. I mean, we, uh, you, you might be aware about the waste flow diagram and being applied in, in Kenya to, together with the, the, the UN Habitat tool. And the results we, we had from Mombasa and, and Nairobi are a bit on the higher side. It's, it's about four point uh, kilos per person and, and capita. And it might be an interesting case to compare with the 8.8 .8, uh, and Obviously, you had rural areas included, um, but it, it might be a super interesting aspect to, to zoom in in those cases where we have uh, the tools being applied and see how they relate to each other and what, what learnings are there and uh, where that, that leads us to. It would be super interesting to, to keep. Um, yeah, uh, and also um, depending on the scope, I, I think in some of our study or project, we really want to have more granulated uh, breakdown of the data in terms of, you know, what type of plastic that's relevant to marine litter, marine plastic, and the type of plastic that's having, you know, uh, pops contents or has a potential to be uh, open burnt, the causing you pops issue. So, I think uh, that's where, um, depending on the, uh, you know, the, the goal, uh, we can adjust the scope of our methodology, and then also to to change or to adapt the survey accordingly. So I think that's why. I would want to suggest that um, every study or every uh, report has different scope and uh, we always need to define what we, what we need in the beginning and then have a little bit of uh, adaptation uh, according to the approach because the requirements, uh, for instance, from the GF will be very different from ICI on climate and will be different from other type of studies. So um, uh, yeah, essentially, um, I think overall framework can be suited to different purposes, but then um, we also need to uh, work on, on, on different solutions. And especially the second part of the module is really to develop solutions based on the hotspot concluded. So we are also working with other agencies like GPUB to see how can we actually bring um, differentiated solution uh, to solve the hotspot that we mapped and uh, also make some scenario uh, forecasting. And that might be another, uh, interface that we can link to other uh, you know tools or database so that's that's kind of um, uh, linkage we, we try to bring uh, I have to say again uh, our methodologies overall framework try to be comprehensive trying to be uh, analyzing the uh, the hotspot 
and uh, we can link with other non-modeling uh, approaches and also solution-based approach and even forecasting tools and uh, but again uh, it, it requires a cooperation among agencies and again also align with the the, the purpose as well so um, yeah great thank you so much Fang. do you have anything that you'd like to add Jonathan? No? okay we have a question from sabina and i sabina if it's okay would you like to ask your question um yeah sure thank you very much and, uh, congratulations uh, it's always really interesting and you know that um, we are using your methodology in in the database and we apply that and and here my question comes i know it is a model but did you come across now you have done several of your uh, pilots and you have had the plastic bag that especially on the baseline when it comes how much plastic is consumed and then ending up in the waste generation that there is uh, not an over ex as an overarching so that the baseline comes closer to the reality uh, any any coefficient built in or any any security measures or any uh, tools in order to help the others that uh, this has um, is, is double and triple checked yeah, and i'm asking because when we were using and validating data and comparing models then it's real that in certain aspects we found that the plastic consumption baseline was um, not met with uh, the baseline assessments then on the other side Okay, so what you're asking to is how do we have these checks and balances in place to avoid over and underestimating, right. and how do we um, ensure that what we're putting in and what we're getting out are accurate reflections of reality. Um, I think from our side, I can answer that a little bit, but I'd also like to um, invite Julian or maybe Alex to also Alexandre to discuss this, but the gist of it is, is that throughout the tutorial and throughout the methodology there are checks and points where you need to look at what you're looking at is what you're getting out of the tools that you're building and the results you're getting do they make sense there are checks and balances within the model or within the the tools themselves and checkpoints to look at them to see if what you've put in is producing the right um the right outputs and that said though um one of the challenges i think we have um included in some of our observations is that not always is there the right data available. Um, we Sometimes we're missing data. Um, and so a lot of this has to be done by estimation. So in terms of, I think some of the feedback we've received is, for example, in Vietnam, last year at this time, we were validating the hotspotting report for Vietnam. And the data that we used there was from 2018. And during the meeting, several of the stakeholders from um, different, like the government and from universities and others that were involved said, well, this is all out of date. It's from 2018, it's not, you know, it's not current. And part of the um, usefulness of the model and the tools is that once you've done it, you can go back and redo it when you have new data. Um, I think, in terms of that, I think it's really a matter of, again, understanding what you're putting in and what you're looking at to, and, and comparing it baseline to other research that's out there. Um, I think, Julian, if you have maybe some comments on this, I think it would be, um, it'd be yeah. great if you could jump in on this. But realistically, I think it's, it's about understanding what the quality is, the data quality that you have to put in to analyze and how accurate that is. Um, and of course, within all of our assessments, we have data quality scores for each of the aspects of it and whether or not you can rely on that, if it's got a good quality score or not, gives you some leeway in terms of what you're presenting to others when you do present the results. Yeah. So, so maybe I can quickly complement. <laughs> I guess in the old process, we are, navigating between uh, data collection and modeling and and we use modeling at different levels in in, in the framework so of, of course what we i mean one of the key you know 
block uh, that you mentioned, Sabine, is how much waste is generated in the country. <clears throat> of course, we want to rob robustify this because this is from, from this quantity that we then derive the, the leakage with, with the model in this case. But the, the quantity of waste generated <clears throat> is not only data collection, uh, primary data collection, it's also a lot of modeling. <clears throat> and um, so of course, uh, is, is it matching with reality is, is like the question we, <laughs> we are all asking ourselves. I think what I mean, and, and we deal with that in different ways. One way is that because this is a model and because this is a fully mass balanced approach, we have different sources of data that um, are used to, to generate this waste management. And, and some of them are like more top down, you know, we start by the production and the import and export, and some of them are more bottom up. So we look at how much waste is actually generated and counted on all this stuff and landfill. And so in a way we have some ways in the model to have some redundancies. And, and so we can, through redundancies and mass balancing, um, ensure that the picture is, you know, coherent uh, and, and, you know, cross um, check within the model the consistency as a way to get uh, you know trust uh, in, in these numbers the other answer is that we have also developed a pedigree matrix system so we can assess the quality of the of the data and, and of the modeling uh, and and of course we are pushing hard and so we, we attribute some scores to the different data and, and modeling outputs and of course we help we use that to track the quality of of, of the data that of the output, of course. And, and the last point is that, of course, uh, we try to be connected with, uh, I mean, not, not stay within our model, but look at all the modeling efforts that happened in the countries. And, and we did some, some benchmark and try, try to understand the discrepancies when, when there are some. And of course, this is one of the best way to uh, yeah, improve and, and detect uh, possible errors. So I guess these are the three three things. So the modeling itself with redundancies and mass balancing, the pedigree matrix, and the cross-checking cross with other studies. But yeah, I guess this is a continuous uh, improvement process. Yeah, but, but maybe it, as a, if, if there is any interest, we would be happy to feedback uh, some of uh, the, the learnings what we have made out of it. And we have worked with the local teams uh, applying your methodology in that respect. Uh, and we have done quite a lot in South Africa. And here we have found the biggest discrepancy in that respect, uh, if this is possible to say in it in such a way. And maybe it's worse than to think what else could be done to fine tune because what is in the baseline must be somewhere either in the formal or informal ways to so somehow it is connected and the check and balance. Um, so that's why I, I was asking. Yeah, so I guess oh. I mean, then it, it's good to it's good Sorry. to discuss <laughs> and, and check uh, if, if you have new new data. Uh, happy to have a meeting. Yeah. Uh, sorry that I jump in. Uh, hello, Sabine. Hello, everyone. Actually, yeah, I was I was part of the thanks teams to create the baseline. Um, uh, as you already know, we apply the national guidance to to do it. And just as you, we encountered some challenges uh, regarding like real data or at least the data collection from regional consultants. And there were differences between the model and this data. And actually, one of the solutions that we apply. And I think it's also it's part of the feedback that we have for the national guidance. It's that uh, also try to modify the entire model from so we can calibrate it and have results based on the waste generation, and maybe take from aside the waste cons uh, the plastics consumption because maybe that can probably give different results. And I think it's it's a feasible process to make. It's not that difficult because, uh, it, as you know, the tools, it's quite simplistic in terms like, oh, like uh, for, for someone that uses quite well Excel. So I think if you, uh, if you find real data and a person that actually uh, have good level in Excel, they can really modify this model and it's not difficult to do it. Great, thank you, Monse. That's a really good um, 
point as well is that, again, I think the skills that are required for this, and this is highlighted within the tutorial, um, skills are definitely needed in Excel and um, a few levels, if you are going to advance through this, um, you will need to know a little bit about Python um, as well as GIS modeling. But again, they are, um, these things are discussed within the tutorial and they are, um, you know, explained, I think, fairly well within the videos and certainly for some of the items um, where there are some complicated steps with certain things within Excel, um, the guidance um, for the tutorial itself is actually quite good. It just takes a little bit of time to sit down and work through it um, bit by bit if you're not an expert already in terms of Excel wizardry. Um, great. I don't see any other questions. I see that Mark had to leave. Um, are there any other questions from the audience? Okay, I think if not, um, I'd like to really, again, encourage everyone to go to the, um, to the website, the um, Lifecycle website, and download the tutorial, look at the videos, um, and think about how you can certainly use them um, to help you do a hot spotting. And I can't believe I spelled your name wrong on the slide. <laughs> Um, so Jenica will now do a quick closing and um, discuss a little bit about um, some of the results we've had and um, do a closing for us for our last webinar of the year. So thank you all for your attention so far. And I will apologize to you for spelling your name wrong on this, typing too fast, <laughs> wrapping this up. Thank you, Ling, and thank you everyone for being here and with us today uh, to share with you uh, essentially what we thought was very important in that, as I think some of the questions and answers that came up today suggested, hotspotting is not a simple task. It's quite complex. It requires a lot of information. It requires a set of variety of skills ranging from someone with some general knowledge of how models work uh, to the actual information collection and gathering, which is equally important because ultimately, uh, as you've heard today, a model is a representation of reality. It's never going to be perfect. And the guidance is something that gives us a mechanism to collate and capture all of this information. And as we went through this process and for UCM, this has been a learning process over the last four years, we recognized that just having just a guidance document was not sufficient. And as you heard earlier from our colleagues at UNEP, this has been a process that has been developing over the last three to four years. And it was recognized that in addition to the actual tools and toolkits, there was a need to provide users the potential to actually understand the mechanics of it. And I think as Sabine very eloquently pointed out as they've applied it in their own work, uh, there are differences in how information or data comes out from what you put in and put out. And I think to that point, very much, I think we are still very much in a learning process and uh, we would very much, I think, be interested to understand and engage on how those nuances can be addressed or looked at and understand where those discrepancies occur. And that I think is fundamentally an essential part of any modeling exercise. Uh, if you go back and look at any kind of different type of initiative. So I think fundamentally applying a guidance such as this tool really is a participatory process. It's not meant to be done individually alone in a lab of just collating information. And I think the, the, the validity of these comes through the participatory process. And I think are you seeing in its applications by actually creating stakeholders and bringing them together, sharing the information and taking them through that process really is equally important uh, to validate those final results that one gets out of the model. So I think that is really an essential part. Um, I think as we move forward, uh, the question is, how do we take this forward? And, and it's an important tool that actually, I think, helps us to collate and put information together uh, that exists or pre-exists, at least to give us a baseline of some kind of assessment. 
And then from there, it can be developed and evolved based on specific issues and interests. And I think you've heard that already that uh, from our colleagues in Asia and Africa, that it spurned specific, more detailed assessments that required more specific information. So the guidance really is that overall hierarchy that enables us to provide some kind of structure to understand where we might want to go from there. Um, secondly, I think uh, very much to the training part, so far we focus very much on a self-learning tool. Uh, we would very much like to develop this into a more active learning process where we can actually use uh, maybe data sets that already exist and take users in a very practical way through that process. So that is certainly something that IUCN would very much like to encourage and propose uh, to see how we can actually function that. And in that context, it would be very interesting to get and learn from your experiences on using this initially and understanding uh, some of those nuances. So um, as some of us, as some of you mentioned, uh, should you apply the tool and produce results, uh, please feel free to share with us some of those results so that we can actually understand and also learn from your experiences. Because I think the refinement of this uh, is not just, this is not the end point, but it's a, it's a process of evolution that will be refined based on additive learning. And I think that really is the secondary objective of today's session to encourage you to apply it and learn and actually to provide feedback. And maybe something Lynn, we can think about early next year is for those of you who have already applied it, uh, maybe to have some kind of a working group session to sort of uh, demystify what we found uh, and look at some of those issues in a little more detail and uh, see how they can be addressed. Because I think that is equally important in any kind of modeling exercise. Um, the second thing I think is the validity of this tool is, as I said, started off with really looking at it from a national assessment point of view. What do you have out there? And can you use that information as the basis? And this has been quite relevant, not just for creating an overall picture of what happens at a national level, but also to provide information to other points. And uh, EA Quantis with its plastic leak project and tool, which is more a business oriented tool actually uses some of this information as a base to actually feed into more specific actions. So uh, ultimately, I believe uh, this type of product can be actually used in multiple ways. And something we didn't really focus as much in detail today is really the, the second part of this product, which is the interventions and instruments that are identified through the hotspot process. And once again, that is not a prescriptive list, but it's one that is meant to grow and develop with user in, users adding to it over time. And the idea is really to understand what are the kinds of areas of actions that could be taken across the plastic life cycle or across different interventions. So uh, in concluding, I think what I would say is uh, it has been really a very important tool, not just purely from an assessment point of view, but also building relationships. I think through this process, at least from the ICN's perspective, we've actually been able to engage with a whole suite of different stakeholders. And as many of you know, in, in some countries, there are multiple players working on the same issue. So I think um, it has actually, from our perspective, a secondary benefit has actually been enabling us to network more effectively with the relevant stakeholders who are doing similar work and collaborating more effectively. So um, there are some of those secondary benefits that come out of applying such a tool in addition to the pure uh, knowledge and the information that one gets out of it. Uh, so in concluding, I think, I think I will say thank you very much for being with us. I know it's been one and a half hours. I hope you have got a glimpse of how to apply the tool. And I really would recommend you, I would really uh, look forward to hearing your feedback on actually looking at some of those training videos. I don't know how many hours they'll take to go through the entire it's amount. A few hours, yeah. But, uh, but it's, it's well worth the time. It's well worth the time. And I we would, from our perspective, welcome any feedback on how we can improve it or things that we could be changed in the future and variations of it. 
So thank you very much and I'll pass it on to Lynn. Thanks. Um, so yeah, thank you everyone for your time today. And uh, again, the Plastic Hotspotting website has the pilots, it has the tutorial, it has the videos which link to the YouTube video of the Lifecycle Initiatives website. Um, and you're welcome to follow us on Twitter. Um, and if you'd like to get a better view too of some of the data work that Plastiques is doing, I've included their website as well on the last slide. And I think with that, I will say thank you to everyone who's um, who's attended today and thank you for your time. And again, if you have additional questions, please feel free to reach out. Um, so have a great day, everyone. Thanks so much. And we'll end the meeting now. Bye-bye, everybody. Thanks.